Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. May the holy names of Jesus and Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, St. Augustine, the great doctor of the church, says the conversion of one sinner is greater than the creation of all of the universe. Great delight today to celebrate one of my special patrons, along with St. Augustine, St. Mary Magdalene, and now today, St. Saint, Saint Margaret of Cortona, great Franciscan penitent patrons, because the way they led their lives, far from God like myself, but coming back into the fold. The Magdalene of the Franciscan order then today, St. Margaret of Cortona, came into the world in the year way back, 12. 47, a place called Laviano near Cortona, which is in the province of Tuscany. When she was seven years old, she lost her pious mother, but she'd been well formed in her youth. She was neglected then by her careless father, who married again in a short time, and then she had this unsympathetic stepmother who dealt very harshly with Margaret so that Margaret, at the age of 18, as soon as she reached of age, she left home to earn her bread amongst strangers. It says that St. Margaret of Cortona was possessed of a rare beauty, and this became a snare for her. For now, for the space of the next nine years, she gave herself up to a life of scandal and sin. Scandal and sin. And one day, she waited a long time in vain for her accomplice in sin to return home to the place where she lived with him. He was quite rich in some form of a castle. Presently, his dog came to her, whining and tugging at her dress. She followed the animal into the heart of the forest. Anxious, not daring to express her own suspicions, she rose and followed the hound wherever it led her, drawing her down into this dense forest a little distance from the castle walls, at a point where a heap of bundle of wood, where a bundle of wood had been piled, apparently by some woodcutters, the hound stood still, whining more than ever, and poking beneath the pile with its nose. Margaret, all trembling, set to work to pull the heaps away. In the hole beneath lay the corpse, lay the corpse of her partner in crime, event, evidently dead for some days, for the maggots and the worms had already begun their work upon it. Then she suddenly stood before the blood, blood stained corpse of this unfortunate man. His enemies had murdered him. At the appalling sight, Margaret of Cortona was stunned like one struck with lightning. Filled with terror, she asked herself, where is his soul now? Where is his soul now? How he had come to his death was never known. After all, in those days of high passions and family feuds, such murders were not uncommon. The careful where though the body had been buried suggested foul play. But for Margaret, the sight she saw now was something more than death. The old faith within her still lived, and now she started to enter into herself, asking many questions. The body of the man she had loved and served was lying there before her. But what had become of his soul? If it had been condemned and was now in hell, who was 
in great part at least responsible for its condemnation, was it not herself? Her whole life came before her, crying out now against this situation. She cried out as she never had before and wept copious tears. What should she do next, she thought. Then and there she firmly resolved in future to be even more penitent than she had been in sin. Like the prodigal son, she returned repentant to her native time, town of Leviano and in a penitential garb, her hair cut short and a cord around her neck, she knelt at the door of the church and publicly asked all the congregation to forgive the scandal that she had given. Many people were edified at this public humiliation of Saint Margaret, but her stepmother was even more embittered. She, as well as fa Margaret's father, forbade her to enter the home. This reception severely tempted Margaret to return back to the road of vice, but God's grace sustained her. Led by divine grace, she made her way to Cortona and made a general confession to a Franciscan priest there who gave her spiritual direction. In a poor little hovel now, she lived a secluded life in penance, tears, and prayer, earning her scanty nourishment by hard labor, hard manual labor. Again and again, St. Margaret of Cortona begged for the habit of the Third Order of the Franciscans, that she might be recognized by the world as a penitent. But not until three years had elapsed and she had been severely tried, her wish was granted. She received the Third Order penitential habit in the year 1277. Now her fair fervor increased. It was almost incredible what rigorous penances she practiced from then on. Day and night, day and night she wept over her sins and often sobs so choked her voice that she could not even speak. Satan made use of every wile and snare to cause Margaret to relapse, but prayer mortification and humiliation successfully put Satan to flight. When finally, after interrupted struggling, she had triumphed over every earthly inclination, God assured her then magnificently that all her sins had been pardoned and granted her special proofs of his knowledge of her innermost secret of hearts. In many an instant when people came to seek a counsel from great distances, she recalled their grievous sins while her exhortations and prayers were instrument, instrumental in bringing about their deep conversion. Many souls were released from purgatory upon her prayers. Almighty God wrought many miracles even in her lifetime. Health was stored to the sick. A dead boy was even raised to life. And at her approach, evil spirits shuddered and left those whom they possessed. Finally, after 23 years of penance, in the 50th year of her life, remember, she converted the year 27. When she was 50, 23 years later, God called this great penitent to the beatific vision, February 22nd, 1297. Her body, if anyone has the grace to go there, is preserved in a precious shrine in the Franciscan church of Cortona in Tuscany, which bears her name. It is even incorrupt, incorrupt this present day and frequently emits a pleasant perfume. Several popes have confirmed the public veneration accorded her and Pope Benedict XIII canonized her amongst great solemnity in the year 1728. So in conclusion, what can we learn from this great penitent today. How remarkable the effects of divine grace and mercy manifested themselves in her 
conversion. She was snatched from the jaws of disgrace into the light and the life of grace. And what brought about this marvelous change? It was her deep and sincere contrition. We must never despair of the conversion of any sinner. Contrition can make you a saint. You yourself must never despair of your own conversion. No matter how difficult it may be to lay aside certain sinful habits, with the grace of God you will succeed and he will never deny the grace to a contrite heart. Remember, conversion is a daily thing. A contrite and humble heart, O God, thou wilt not despise, Psalm 50. A well, note well, sincere contrition is a grace in itself from the Blessed Virgin Mary, her intercession. So what constitutes this true contrition? It is sorrow of the soul which detests the sins committed and has a firm resolution not to sin again. The thought of having offended God and deserved his punishments must be the cause of your sorrow. Many of us in our conversion come to the confession initially with the thoughts looking at ourselves. This is attrition where we fear more the pains of hell rather than looking towards the Lord. God willing, this moves then into sincere contrition, looking not to offend the goodness of God. Saint Margaret had this contrition, as also Saint Mary Magdalene. This is why their many sins were forgiven them. Remember Christ says, you have been forgiven much because you have loved much. We should again and again make acts of contrition even for past sins. It is also good and a holy practice to renew your sorrow for the transgressions of your past sins in the confessional, according to the words of the prophet, wash me yet more from my iniquity. Even if like St. Margaret, you were assured by divine revelation of the full pardon of your sins, the love of God should keep you in your heart, should encourage you to keep in your heart lively sorrow for having offended so good a Lord Jesus Christ. This sorrow should move you to lead a life of penance. And for this reason, the Holy Fathers tell us that a life of the Christian should be an in, uninterrupted act of penance. Penance, penance. We ask this grace through the mother today, a penance through the mother, the Immaculate, the Corridemptics, the queen of all penitents, so that when someone ponders over your soul held in the bundle of wood of your coffin, your passage into the forest of eternity, they will know that your soul will be glorifying the Lord of hosts for all eternity, forever and ever. Amen. May the holy names of Jesus and Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.